So last night we sort of concluded with talking about the holiness of God and what was our anchor text, 1 Peter 2, that God has called each of us in the body of Christ, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord. He's called us to be a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. And so you have a special privilege and a special purpose and a, and a, and a special uh, mandate to live the life of a priest, one who goes before God regularly, because that's what the priest did. He went before God. The priest was the one who was designated to be able to access God, right? No one else in Israel could directly access God in the way that the priest did, and, and that was one person at a time, <laughs> one person at a time, once a year, right? The high priest. Now we have billions of believers throughout time who can now enter into the very presence of God without fear. And so that's the privilege that we have. And so I want to continue that. And so last night, as we talked about the holiness of God, this just was in my spirit. I wanted to share this with you this morning by way of song. Holy, 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 Lord God almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee holy 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 merciful and mighty god in three persons Blessed Trinity. Come on, you know, you can sing it. Holy, holy, second verse. Holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide thee, though the eyes of sinful men thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power and love and purity. Last verse. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea, holy, 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 merciful, and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Sing it again, God in three persons. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God, we worship and we honor you. You are the holy, 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 thrice holy God. We worship and adore you and reverence your name. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Amen. No, that's for the Lord. So as I mentioned to you, we have an anchor text that we will get to today because it would actually be a part of the teaching. But First Peter 2, it will talk about what God has called us to be. But right now, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. There's no other book of Matthew. There's no, no, there's no need to say gospel of Matthew. But turn to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 50. And we begin there where we see our Lord Jesus. It's good when we come in. Happy Sunday, everybody. It doesn't feel like Sunday, but it's Sunday morning. And so on the Lord's Day, um, it's good that we come into this space that we make the house of the Lord. The Lord, the Bible says that God dwells not in temples made with hands, but everywhere God's people are, where we gather, there the Lord is in the midst of us. And we are the temple 
of the Lord. And wherever we gather, it's a holy place because the presence of God is with us. Amen. And that's what that's what it means to be called to be a part of his priesthood. So in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, and I have it up there on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you, but we can read it. And it says this. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So Jesus is on the on the cross giving his life. Right. Uh, the, the, The text gives us this this place where he is uh the the people hear him crying out to the father and he says father eli eli lama sabachthani lord my my god why have you forsaken me where are you god i don't feel your presence remember we talked about the holiness of god so here's here's what what, one of those correlations we make to the old testament scripture remember those little goats that we talked about those goats that died there was two of them one of them well both of them didn't die but one of them died the other one kind of got this privilege of not dying like oh i escaped that buddy (laughs) I didn't, I didn't get the, I didn't get killed, but one of them dies, bang, sorry for him. And then the other one, they, the priest would speak over him, all of the sins of the nation. It would, he would place his head on his, on his head, on his hand on his head. And he would transfer by verbal, verbal transfer all the sins of the nation upon that goat. And then let him set, set him free in the wilderness. It's like, what was that all about? And so the Bible says that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. And so, again, the beauty of the law of God, that that looks mysterious and mystique, and and it looks strange to us, but it was really something that God was pointing to that would happen, that would be a beautiful death by our Lord, and that he bore all of the sins in his body on the cross. But here's the beauty of it. Those goats didn't deserve to die because those goats didn't do anything wrong. It was the people that sinned. And Jesus himself, the Bible says, he who knew no sin, he became sin. Not that Jesus' nature became sinful, but he became guilty of sin as a sin offering on our behalf. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become, what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Beautiful exchange of the Lord. So that's what's happening on the cross right now. Okay. So verse 15 said, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple. Remember that the, the, the tabernacle I showed you there? There was a veil between the Holy of Holies, right? That veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And that was the most holy place. Jesus, the scripture says, when he died, the veil of the temple, so it was no longer the tabernacle. Remember, it became the temple of Solomon. And then 400 years later, again, and the two names that I did not remember last night were Nehemiah and Ezra who went to, to rebuild the temple, right, 400 years after uh, it was built and after it was torn down by uh, the, the surrounding nations at, uh, when they invaded Israel, okay, and they went into captivity. But they rebuilt it, and then it became later torn down and then rebuilt again under the uh, New Testament. It became Herod's temple. So this is the temple we're talking about. And... This temple now, so remember there was no Ark of the Covenant anymore because it had been lost. It had not been recovered. But the temple where the priests would still go in and, and, and still go before the, uh, the Lord and, and sacrifices were still being given on behalf of the people. Jesus tore that veil apart, signifying that the way into the most holy, most intimate place with God was now torn apart and there was no more separation between God and man for those who accepted Jesus Christ. And as we sang that song, is nothing but the blood. The blood. You say you want to be holy, you want to be set free, you want to be free of your guilt. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that does it for us. And he says, it says, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now that was a pretty interesting time going on right there where people started seeing people who were previously dead just walking around in Jerusalem. I'm not going to get into that because that's a pretty um, interesting time where we don't have time to get into what was going on there and why. But just know that that happened and it signifies a time where it's going to happen again. The Bible says the dead in Christ is going to rise, right? All right. So 53, and coming out of graves after, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Verse 54, so when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, they saw the earthquake and the things that happened. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was the Son of God. Let's look to the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you this morning. We ask that, God, that you would just uh, fill us this morning. God, with your presence, speak to us. Lord God, make your, the, the, as we prayed, well, Psalm 119, 18, 
Lord, open our eyes and show us beautiful things out of your law that we may know the Lord our God, that we may come to love the Lord our God and that we will walk in his ways in obedience in a way that is pleasing to him. How we need you, O oh Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so this morning, we get this opportunity to talk about Jesus and how he transitions us into this priesthood that we now partake of. It was Jesus and his earthly ministry where he was, op he was operating as prophet. Okay, he was coming to foretell of the things that would, ha would happen, the things that would happen uh, uh, to him and what he had to do in his earthly ministry to, 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 for, to uh, 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 seal and to accomplish the task of reconciling man to God. Okay, and he would tell of the things to come. So he, he operated in his earthly ministry as prophet. Then he became the very sacrifice that the Old Testament scriptures foretold of. The Old Testament scriptures foreshadowed. He became that very sacrifice that shed his blood on Calvary's cross again so that we could be covered by the blood. As the scripture says that the Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sin. But what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus coming on the scene at the beginning of his ministry? He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away away, not covers, but takes away the sins of the world. And thank God for Jesus, because my sin, the Bible says that God throw, takes your sins, and as you have confessed Jesus and repented of your sin, he takes your sins and throws them into a sea of forgetfulness. And he doesn't bring them back up to you anymore. It's not that God doesn't have a memory, it's that God chooses not to hold it against you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been justified. Not that you deserve it, but he did it based on the, on, on the merit of who Jesus was, not upon who we are. He did it based on the grace that he forced to all of us, not on what we deserve, but, but what glorifies him. Okay? And so the good news is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ signified the end of the Aaronic priesthood. So the scripture tells us that, you know, the blood of goats and bulls, it couldn't accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. But true righteousness comes by Jesus Christ. He truly gives the righteousness that he lived. Here's how we explain it. Jesus is, how long did he live on earth? 33 years, right? Okay, three years of earthly ministry. So by the time he was 30, he became, uh, you know, he went into his earthly ministry. So 33 years, the Bible says that he knew no sin. He lived a perfect, righteous, sinless life. That life became an offering to God on the cross and that sinlessness and perfection that Jesus offered to God on the cross because a man died. What did God say in the beginning of, uh, uh, in the book of Genesis in the day that Adam, who represented all of mankind in the day that he sinned, that he said he would surely die. So the penalty of sin is death. And so, so that you don't have to die the death that you all deserve and that I deserve, Jesus did it in our place. And therefore, God can legally forgive you. He can legally let you off the hook because somebody paid the price for you, right? Someone in court, this says, you know, th th there has to be someone guilty. There has to be a verdict, right? And the judge can't just let you slide and let you off because you actually owe because of the law you broke. But the just judge who was God says, okay, I'll make a way that you can get off the hook. I'll put my son in your place, right? Okay, so that righteousness that Jesus lived for 33 years, that righteousness is now given to you. You're given righteous status before God so that now when you come before God as a priest, as a royal priesthood, when you come before God praying, God doesn't see you. And how many of you thank God that he doesn't? It doesn't, it's not that he doesn't know who you are. It's not that he doesn't know you're a sinner. It's that he doesn't hold that against you anymore because his son stands before you as a mediator. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He stands be between you and God the Father so that when you come before God, God sees his son. And now he grants you all the privileges that he would grant to his son based on the righteousness of him it has nothing to do with you. And like the song said, it's nothing but the blood. Amen. Nothing but the blood. So the good news, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ signified the end of the Aaronic priesthood as the means by which we enter into the presence of God anymore. Jesus' once for all sacrifice of himself on the cross satisfies God's requirement for the shedding of blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be what? No forgiveness of sin. Jesus' sacrifice removed the barrier so that veil being rent in the temple in two is signified that the barrier between God and man was now done away. 
the removal of the veil of the temple signified that the way was made for sinful man to have relationship with a holy God. Okay? So, where am I going backwards? Sorry. I should go forward. Okay, here we go. That's where I want to go. All right. So, Jesus transitioned from that prophet. Now, he is operating as our high priest. Because where did Jesus go? After he died on the cross. Well, first there was this time period where he, the Bible says that he went to, to a place called Sheol, and he went and, and, and rescued all of the, the believing Old Testament saints, right, who were waiting on his coming and because they believed on the future coming of Messiah. But then he went to the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says that he now is there interceding for us. So who has Jesus become on our behalf? The Bible says he has become our faithful high priest. He is now in the very... At, you know, very direct presence of the Father interceding on our behalf. Listen, you have strength with you. Understand who you are. And not only do you have the privilege and the right to come before God as a priest that he's given you, a priesthood, but you also have Jesus, our high priest, who's also fighting for you and going to bat for you before the Father. The Bible says we have an, a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. So you got to understand who you are and what you have in Jesus. And so, remember in the Old Testament priesthood, in order to be a priest, number one, to, the, the, the priest could ha had to come from the line of Aaron, Moses' brother, right? And so Aaron's sons could only be priests. It'd be like uh, Tyler and Austin, right? <laughs> the sons of Gary, the sons of Hamrick, right? Hopefully they don't offer strange fire. No, I love those guys. Tyler and Austin are, are, are doing a great job carrying the mantle of the Father's ministry. Praise God for them. Um, but Aaron's sons could, you know, they were the only ones who, was who could be designated as priests. Your lineage, actually, your bloodline actually had to be verified in order for you to, 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 to operate in the priesthood. They had to determine what line you're from. And you had to be from a specific tribe. You had to be from the Levitical tribe, the tribe of Levi, okay? And directly the sons of Aaron to be priest, okay? Jesus was not from the Levitical priest, the Levit Levitical tribe. And so, Technically, on, in his earthly ministry, Jesus could not op operate as a priest, but Jesus has become our high priest with a different order of priesthood after the order, the Bible says, of Melchizedek. Now, anybody remember Melchizedek? He was this very mysterious figure in the Old Testament scripture. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says, talks about this time where Abraham went to war with a group of kings that had uh, kidnapped his nephew Lot. And Abraham went to war with these kings. And on his way back from the, the, his, the battle, he, he won the battle and, and took the spoils. On his way back, he ran into this mysterious pre king priest named Melchizedek. And so the Bible says that he was without lineage. He was without record. Nobody knew where he came from. Nobody knew who his people was, right? They knew, didn't know who his father was, but he was a priest. And so the, so the Bible says now that the priesthood that Jesus is a part of is now a new priesthood that's not based on your bloodline, not based on the fact that you're one of Aaron's sons, but it is a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which it has nothing to do with your bloodline. But it's because of what he accomplished on the cross and what God designated him to be as our eternal high priest. Okay? So that's what that means. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So if you have your, you have your Bible, if you want to turn there, you don't have to. I'm going to put it on the screen. Hebrews chapter 7 talks about this. Here's, here's where we are. I'm going to read it, and you can read it on the screen if you want, or you can just listen along. Hebrews chapter 7. If perfection could have been obtained or attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? So he's talking about Jesus, right? It's now in the book of Hebrews, the writer who is unknown in, in a lot of respects. There's some, there some speculation about who that writer could be. Some say it could be Paul. Some say it could have been Apollo, who so the Bible said was a mighty man in the scriptures. The, the, those are some of the, 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 the ideas and, and speculations, right, the theories about who this writer was. But the writer is, is well accepted as being unknown in the book of Hebrews. But he says this. He has to be someone who actually is well acquainted with the, uh, uh, the understanding of the law of Moses and the the Aaronic priesthood, right, to contrast this new coming priesthood of Jesus with the old one and how this new one replaces the old, and it's better, and we thank God we have it. So he says this, this is what, and that's what Hebrews is telling us here. But it says, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in order of the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? 
Verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe and not one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear. So you couldn't be a priest, again, from any other tribe. You couldn't be a, a, only from the tribe of Levi, right? Your king could not be a priest, okay? No one else in, in the nation of Israel could be a priest other than one who came from that line of Aaron and Levi. Verse 14 I'm sorry, let me go to verse, first, uh, back to verse 13. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear in that our Lord was from Judah, the Bible says. He was from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David, right? So David could not be a priest because he was of the tribe of Judah. He was the king, and he was in the lineage of our Messiah. And in, it says that the Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation of his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever. Who's he talking about? Jesus. And this was from the book of Psalm. Psalm 110, 4 actually prophesied this. It was prophetically written there. It says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. So what did God call the Old Testament priesthood? Weak and useless. Not that it wasn't useful for the time period in which God instituted it, right? Because it was instituted to cover the sins of the nation of Israel. But it was useless to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish, which was a perpetual righteousness in which you were made right with God at your very core. Everybody follow me? Okay. I need you to talk back to me now. It's early in the morning, but hey, look, you with me? All right. All right. All right. That way I know you're, you're live. You got a pulse. Um, okay. It says you are priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. So what is it that we now do? We draw near to God because of the priesthood that he gives you. You have that right. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests with an oath. Without, uh, others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely. One of the translations said he is able to save to the uttermost. That means he can he can delve down to the lowest place. I don't care where you are. Jesus saves to the uttermost completely. It doesn't matter how low you've gone down. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. God can go to the deepest place and darkest place of our sin and save us and bring us up to a place where you're right with God. Amen. And so he says he can save completely to the uttermost. Those who come to God, watch this, through him. If you come to God through him, he can save you. I don't care who you are because he always lives to intercede for them because you have the perfect one, the holy one who is interceding for you on the right hand of the father. And says such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. You've got somebody who is interceding for you and it is the great, high priest, the most high God himself in the person of the son, son of God. All right. And so now I want to move us forward as we talk about how that, that high priest, Jesus, our faithful high priest, how he transfers that priesthood to you. All right. So it says here, I wrote in my notes, Christ, our high priest identifies with us in our suffering. Hebrews chapter four says, it says that we have not a high priest who cannot identify with us in our suffering because like as we are, the Bible says he was tempted in every way so that he can comfort you in your temptation. And let me tell you right now, how many of you know that you, if you have not been, or you, if you know you have been, and you know you will be tempted in this life, you're going to face some suffering. You're going to endure temptation. You're going to endure some things. And I'm trying to tell my own children, there's going to come a time where you, you, the rubber's going to meet the road and you're going to need the Lord. You're going to need a place to hide. You're going to need, as the scripture says, you're going to need a place of refuge. You're going to need a place to go to get strength because there's coming a time where you're going to suffer something. 
It could be some suffering that has to do with your own inter-struggles, your own interpersonal struggles. You may be wrestling with anxiety, wrestling with mental issues, wrestling with emotional issues, or you could be pressured and tempted from the outside of you. Whatever that, the source of your temptation, whatever, whatever the source of your suffering, you're going to endure something, and you're going to need the rock. As, as Moses, uh, uh, the, God said, he, he, you know, he, hid, he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. You're going to need to be able to hide in the rock that is our rock of salvation, Jesus. You're going to need a place to go when this life gets tough. I'm trying to tell my children that. You better learn to pray. You better learn to get in the word of God. You better learn to seek refuge. You better have a place that you can hide. Learn the secret of the secret place of God. You're going to need a place to go because this life is going to get rough. But here's the thing. Again, the hope is, the good news is that you have a high priest who understands. Jesus was tempted and, and, and pressured at all points like we are. You say, whoa, wait a minute. Jesus was tempted like me? And because you're thinking right now about the ways that you've been tempted, and you're saying Jesus couldn't have been tempted that way. Yes, he was. Not in exactly the way that you were tempted, but the Bible says he was tempted at every point that you can be tempted. The scripture says this, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three places where everybody can be tempted. The lust of the flesh, the lust of your eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus was tempted there. Remember in Jesus, when he's getting prepared to go into his earthly ministry, he fasts and prays and he goes into the wilderness. And he's go, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil tempts him. He says, guess what? I know you're hungry. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? And Jesus said, no, no, no. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And listen, there's going to come a time where the enemy of your soul is going to tempt you to, to meet your own fleshly needs by departing from God's provision for you and doing it on your own by, some own, by your own means in the flesh to meet some fleshly need or carnal need that you have. But the, the, the task that you have before you is to stay faithful to God by allowing God to meet your needs and not allow your flesh to take over to do what your flesh thinks is best for it. Because that's always going to lead you to a place of destruction of, the, of, of your fellowship with God. Not your salvation. But it's going to destroy your fellowship with God. You're not going to feel worthy to come before God because your sin is going to be ever present before you. And our sin is always ever present before us. But if you're engaging in your sin and you're giving into your sin and you're not experiencing victory in your personal life, then you're going to be walking in shame. And God has not called you to walk in shame. God has called you to walk in victory. And the only way you can walk in that victory is by getting in that place where the word of God is richly indwelling in your heart and you're going to God as the refuge for your soul. And you're finding that place where you get strength, coming into the house of God, worshiping, going into your secret place, worshiping and praying before God and getting in your word, getting together with other believers who can strengthen you and pray with you. You got to have a place you go. Amen. And Jesus understands. So he was tempted at the place of being tempted in the flesh. Satan tried to get him to meet his own fleshly need and disobey the word of the father, which in his course of, 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 of purpose which was to preserve himself and to sacrifice and to sanctify himself by fasting before the Father because he had an earthly ministry ahead of him and he was not to get off course. And he told Satan, it is written, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so from that point, Satan said, yo, okay, I can't get you there. He says, look at all of these kingdoms over here. I can give you that. Look at all these things. If you would bow down and worship me. And he said to him, it is written, man shall worship one God. Man shall worship the Lord God himself and no other shall you worship. It is written. And there's going to come a time where Satan's going to offer you, the enemy of your soul is going to offer you by pleasing you, pleasing your eyes. That's the, that's the sin that he actually set Eve off course. He said, so the Bible says that she saw the fruit that it was pleasing to her eyes. It was appealing to her. Satan's going to offer you something that's appealing, a relationship that's appealing because it looks good on the outside, some sort of opportunity that's appealing because it looks good on the outside, but it's not going to be good for you once you bathe it and put it through the lens and the, and the, and the, the structure of the word of God and you look at the word of God and say, no, I can't accept that. I can't do that, although it looks good. It's not good for me. And so he was tempted at that point, which you're going to be tempted as well by the lust of your eyes. The Bible says also that Satan came to him one more time and he said, listen, if you jump off of the side of this cliff, won't God save you? Because he said he'll save you unless you dash your foot against a stone. And Satan partially quotes the word of God. How many of you know the devil knows the word? 
He'll quote it partially to you, but the, the, the task of discernment and understanding truth is not determining what's right or wrong, but the difference between what's right and what's almost right. Get in your words so that you can have your senses sharpened so that you know how to exercise discernment to know the difference between good and evil. So that when Satan comes to you giving you partial scripture, some dude who's not a Christian, but he says, I want to go to church, that should be good enough. No, you can't date a dude just because he goes to church. He has to be born again and sold out to Jesus. And same goes for you brothers who are dating women. Don't date someone unless they are sold out, living for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would live for the Lord whether it was about you or not. They would go on living for Jesus if you were in the picture or not. That's the kind of person you want. Am I talking to anybody? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Yes. So again, uh, you, you want to make sure that what it is that you're doing is not being, you're not being lulled away by our own pride. The Bible says the pride of life. And Satan would try to get Jesus at the point of pride. God, I deserve this. If I jump off of the cliff and do something stupid, I deserve to be saved, don't I? I deserve for God's provision. I deserve for God to meet my need in this way. You don't deserve anything. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve God's judgment. And the attitude of a Christian with the, filled with the Holy Spirit should be that of humility and grace that says, I don't deserve one thing, but I need to humble myself before the holy God and say, God, whatever you give me, whatever way you choose to bless me, I will be satisfied. I'll be satisfied with whatever you do in my life, God. It's not about me. It's about you. And Jesus understood that at his core because he's the sinless son of God. But he says, no, I shall not. I won't cast myself off the side of a mountain and expect God to meet my need by doing something stupid. No, God's, I, I, listen, I'll say it like this. My mother used to tell me this. Son, God don't bless no mess. God is not going to save your mess and, and, and salvage it when you go and do something stupid and disobedient. No, scrap it and go back to square one and be obedient to God. You go through life living disobediently and making a bunch of messes that you want God to come back and clean up and that you want God to make right and set right and be this, living this fairy tale happily ever after life. It's not going to happen. You're going to have headache. What happened to Abraham when he got out of God's will and slept with his handmaiden Hagar? God already promised him something, but he decided to get impatient and slept with his handmaiden Hagar, which was against the love of God because it was adultery against his wife. And it was also not what God had promised them. It was the indirect, you know, way for him to get around what God had promised in obedience. It was his own uh, sense of, uh, of what was right in his own eyes. And it led to generations upon generations of headache through a dude named what? Ishmael. And the Bible says he became a wild man and generations after him were wild men and everybody's hand was against him in that war. And right now you see that going on in the Middle East with the wars of Arabic nations against, against Israel. His mistake, his one decision to get out of the will of God led to generations of pain for other people. Be careful that you don't build an infrastructure in your life of disobedience because sometimes you can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. So while you're young, the Bible says, while you're young, he said, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember the Lord. All right. Where am I in my notes? I don't know. Okay, yeah, so I said Christ is a faithful high priest because he was tempted at every point just like we are, okay? And he identifies with us. You say, well, Jesus was God. He doesn't know what I'm going through. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He, he, you say, Jesus, can he identify with me because I experienced great loss in my life and I'm, and I'm lonely. You think Jesus wasn't lonely? That's why the Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was praying, and the Bible says he was so overwhelmed with anxiety because of the task ahead. He was so lonely. The Bible says that he began to sweat great drops of blood. The, 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 the uh, theologians and, and scientists and, and those in the medical field call it hematidrosis. It was an actual real thing where blood, his, ver his capillaries and veins were bursting because he was under such duress, and it was blood coming out of his veins and coming out of his pores. Don't tell me God, the Son of God doesn't understand loneliness. You mean to tell me God understands loss, but I lost somebody in my life, God, and, and, and I'm, I'm in great pain. How much more can you lose than your very son who God the Father had to sacrifice and he couldn't even lay his eyes on him because he was so holy. He had to turn his back on his very son whom the sins of the world was upon him. You don't tell me that the Father can identify with loss? that Jesus doesn't identify with loneliness. There was only one point in time in the history of eternity where Jesus felt what it, tasted what it was like to be separated from his father. It had nothing to do with anything that he did wrong. You say, well, somebody did me wrong and I had no, I had no, no, no control over what they did to me. It was wrong. 
Someone abused me. Someone, someone caused me pain. Well, Jesus said, I didn't commit any sin, and yet I still suffered for you, and I did nothing wrong. You don't understand that Jesus identifies with your pain? He does. And that's when, it, when the Bible says that he can identify with us in our suffering. He absolutely does. So I don't think I have to go through those other points. Anymore. I think I made those points before. So let's get to the meat of what we're talking about in our priesthood. So the priesthood of the believer, we're finally there. Hebrews chapter 10, I'll put the, I got the passage up right here, says this. Here's what we'll, we'll, we'll launch pad today into 1 Peter, which was our anchor text that I read to you last night. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember the holiest place, the holy place, the holy of holies. The, the, the high priest by himself could only go in once a year. Now the Bible says you have a boldness that you can go into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Come with confidence. Come with boldness. You can come to the Lord Jesus Christ knowing that you can access his presence and God will meet you there. It says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here's just simply what that means. Get in the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to show you where your sinfulness is, but come boldly knowing that Jesus Christ paid it all for every sin that you have, and you can come with a confidence knowing that you're covered, that God's got you, right? But you got to confess. As Pastor Austin has been talking about, God knows our sin God knows we're sinful, but you have to have a brokenness. And I'm going to tell you something. The scripture tells us, David understood this. He says, that God will draw near and he is near to those who are of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Here's what Jesus would say in the Beatitudes, his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. What is he saying? Blessed are those who are in a constant state of crying and going to funerals? No. He said, blessed are those who mourn. The mourning he's talking about is what James said. He said, turn your laughter into mourning. We are to be people who are not just in a constant state of silliness and rejoicing, but a, 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 an understanding that we need to be mourning over the fact that when it comes to a holy God, we don't measure up. And I'm not saying that there's not joy in this life. There should be joy. We're not walking around all the time with sucking lemon faces, Right? Lemon sucking faces. We're not walking around like that all the time. Jesus said, as a matter of fact, when you fast and pray, don't look like the men you're fasting and praying. Wash your face, put some lotion on, get rid of the ashiness. You know, that's what Jesus would say, right? He said, don't look like that, right? Don't put on these, you know, kind of, you know, pious sort of looks. So, no, that's not what he's talking about. But there's an inner sense of brokenness over your sin, like Isaiah had. Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm not like God. I've got thoughts that are not like him, man. I've got, man, if I could put a jumbotron of the thoughts that have gone through my head just this morning, I couldn't face you anymore. Because there's stuff that goes through my heart and kind of runs through my mind that I'd be ashamed of. And it's coming out of my own heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 said, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who could even know it? Who could even know? You don't even know the depth of your own heart. And it should cause you to mourn before God and have a brokenness and say, no, I'm not having this false sense of humility, this false sense of, oh, woe is me because I just want to be, you know, constantly, you know, sort of self-loathing. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that having a real recognition of your true spiritual poverty, that you are spiritually impoverished before God. You bring nothing to God in and of yourself. As Paul said, I know that in this flesh there's nothing good recognize you bring nothing and that is the place when you come before God recognize that I'm a sinful being and when you come there saying God but I need you God I want to I need to be with you I'm not just doing this out of a form or fashion when I'm here praying God and in my private time it's because I'm drawing near to you God because I recognize that I am hopeless and and I'm lost without you I can't even face the day and that's the place you have to be daily that's the task before you as a believer who is called to be a priest before God, you can draw near and you're drawing near because the one who you're drawing near to, he is your source for everything you need. Amen. And so you're drawing near with the intent 
that, God, I'm drawing near to you because I need more of you. I need more of you. All right? So, finally, we're at 1 Peter 2 and 4. 1 Peter 2 and 4, so that was our anchor text. So if you want to turn there, you can. If you just want to listen along, that's fine. 1 Peter 2 and 4 says this. I read it to you last night. I'm sorry, let me go to 5. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to do what? Watch this. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Why was it important that Jesus, we understand Jesus' high priestly ministry? Because it is through Jesus' high priestly ministry, he is interceding on behalf of you. He has given you his righteousness. His blood takes away all of your sin. So now you have the right and the access to God yourself to come before God, and you're now supposed to be doing the job of offering spiritual sacrifices to God. What are those spiritual sacrifices? We'll talk about them. Verse 9, going down. It says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Sorry, lost it. A holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So one of the things, one of the jobs of the, high, of the priest in the, in the Old Testament scripture, according to the law of Moses, was to teach the people God's word to teach the people God's law and to make sure that the people were following a pattern of, 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 the, of following the law of the Lord. And you can see through the generations in the history of Israel, when the priests got away from that, the people got away from that, the nation was in chaos. It was in turmoil. People were doing right in their own eyes. And God was judging them. God would allow people, nations, surrounding nations, to, and they were, and they were, and ultimately because they weren't on the track and following the law of God and the word of God and faithfulness to the Lord, they were ultimately in, in, uh, inviting idol worship into their camp. They were ultimately taking on the ways of the surrounding nations and practicing idolatry. And God would allow their enemies to come in and invade them because they did not maintain their defenses. And the defenses that God wanted them to maintain was not military. Their defenses was faithfulness to the Lord. And let me tell you something, faithfulness to the Lord in your life will, will shield you and it will, it will protect you from going through a lot of unnecessary heartache and pain. It will shield you by staying right. One of the, my pastors used to tell me as a boy, he said the safest place, he didn't tell me directly, but he would preach to the church. He said the safest place you can be in is the will of God. So if you pray, you say, God, I just want your will for my life. I don't want to do what I want to do. It's not my will, but your will be done. That's what our Savior prayed. Not my will, but your will be done. The safest place you can be is in God's will. All right? So let's go back here. So believers, are now, so at this point, if, you want to, if you're taking notes, because right, I, I went through a whole lot of notes. My son told me, Dad, you were going a little too fast for me to take down some of that stuff you said. But uh, if you're taking notes, believers are now the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. So we've transferred from the old tabernacle, the old temple, all right, which are no longer standing, which are no longer up and no longer oper operable. And now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the building where, the, where, where God is dwelling and the holy presence, very presence of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He dwells in you. Number two, believers. Okay. Believers can come boldly to the throne of grace. Guess what? Aaron and those guys in the book of Leviticus, God told Aaron, he said, listen. He said, first of all, he said, Moses. He said, Moses, tell Aaron, don't worry. If you just do what I tell you to do, you won't die. There was this fear that, that sort of was shrouding their, 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 their you know, the, the manner in which they would come before God, right? There was fear always there because if they didn't do, if they got one point, at one point got off course or did one thing wrong, they would die. And you say, man, God, you're, God, yeah, that's a little, that's a little, oh, that's a bit of an overreaction, isn't it, God? And remember we talked about the holiness of God last night, the holiness of God. It wasn't God overreacting. They were being exposed to the holiness of God. And the holiness of God itself demands judgment of anything that's less than holy. And that's why Jesus is so beautiful. The blood he shed is so beautiful because now you no longer have that fear of making a wrong step. Even if you do, what do we have? Grace. If you get off course, don't worry, you have grace. But just know grace is not a license to do whatever you want in sin. Grace is there because God knows we're going to get it wrong. 
And grace is there to pick you up. And the Bible says that grace is also a teacher to teach you that, guess what? You, shouldn't no, you should no longer be running full speed in the wrong direction, but you should be making steps toward righteousness, toward perfection. And not that we will be perfect in this life, but you will make it like, so I heard a preacher say like this, it's not about your perfection, it's about your direction. What direction are you running in? And sometimes you may fall down on that run. You may fall down in the course of that, that, that journey. But get back up because you have grace. The Bible says that a just man may fall a few times, but he gets right back up again. Get up again. Don't wallow in your sin. If you fall, so what? Get up, repent, confess, get in God's word, and get back on track. Get back on track. Just don't be somebody who's taking advantage. God knows the difference between those who take advantage of his grace. Paul says, what, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. May genoita was the strongest for, uh, 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 expression of a forbidden, uh, uh, anything that was forbidden in the Jewish terms. Meganotab, God forbid. We don't take advantage of God's grace. He said, but it's there for you when you need it. Amen. All right. So you can come boldly before that throne of grace. Don't come irreverently, but come boldly. Don't come with a, with a sense of entitlement, but come boldly. Come confidently. All right. Believers are called to go to God on behalf of others. As a, high, as a priest, not a high priest, but as a priest, and part of God's priesthood, you can come boldly and you can come on behalf of others. Praise God for little Ava in her heart, her parents teaching her, her dad's teaching her, mom's teaching her how to pray for other people. Praise God for that. That's what a priest does. Praise on behalf of others. Believers also are seated in, the Bible says, in heavenly places in Christ. You are now positionally made right with God. You are now positionally in a different place with God. You are a royal priesthood. You're in a line of royalty now. You're seated now in heavenly places in Christ. That means in heaven, your, your, your father in heaven, as, 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 as your high priest Jesus is interceding for you, now sees you in a position where he now obligates himself to take care of you and to bless you and to take care of your needs and to make sure that you are good because now you are in a position where you are under his royal lineage. That's amazing to me. All right? In the Old Testament scripture, in the book of Exodus, it was, Moses said this to the, to, the, to the nation of Israel on Mount Sinai. He says, Exodus chapter 19 and 6, it says, you shall become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Was that not prophetic to what 1 Peter said? The book of Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 through 10, it says this, and they sang a new song as John the Revelator was, was, was prevailing. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and your, with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and every language and every people from every nation. You have made them a kingdom of what? Priests to serve God and they will reign on the earth, talking about the coming kingdom of the Lord and as he establishes his kingdom on earth. You will be a nation of priests and kings. We are royalty. And I love the fact that it says from every nation, every tribe. Listen, the world that we live in today wants us to divide ourselves by race and wants us to divide ourselves by people groups. And in the body of Christ, we are not divided by those things. God makes our, our, our people groups beautiful, but we come into a common place where all of our life and all of our experiences are valid before God and we become one people. No longer divided by the things that the world divides. Do not get caught up in this race baiting and the race division that the world perpetuates. We are royal people under the Lord. You are in Christ. You're my brother, my sister. I've got more in common with you than I do with people who look exactly like me. Amen? Okay. So we're going to move forward here. I'm coming to a close here. All right. So why has God called us to draw near to him? The obvious reason is that we are called to draw near to God so that we may fellowship with God. But listen, you ever think about it like this? We, look, we come to God oftentimes because we got, want God to minister something to us. But do you ever think about this? God wants you to draw near to him because he wants you to minister to him. You're called to minister to God. What did, I, what did I talk about last night in the book of Revelation? There are creatures who were created simply for the purpose of bowing down before God day and night without ceasing to cry holy. God doesn't need your praise. God doesn't need your adulation or adoration, but he deserves it. We ought to give it. We're commanded to do so. And he is worthy of it. 
And when you come before God and you bless God, as the song was telling us earlier, bless the Lord, whatever situation you're in, bless God, whether in much or in, in plenty or in, in, in empty, when your hands are empty, bless God. When you learn to live a life where you bless God, God, I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to bless you because my circumstances have nothing to do with the fact that you're just good. My circumstances does not determine how good you are. You're good because of who you are. You're worthy because of who you are. It has nothing to do with circumstances. It has nothing to do with my feelings. But the Bible says that you are called to offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice meaning you're not always going to feel like praying to God and giving him praise. You're not always going to be in the mode to do it. You're not always going to be in the mind to do it. But I, I guarantee you, when you come and you sacrifice to God and you say, God, I'm going to bless you. Here I am, God. You're worthy of my praise. And you do that long enough and you do it persistently. I'm going to tell you what, it's not going to be long before God gets in there with you. And he's going to show up and bless you. And then in that exchange, God is going to give you what you need. There's strength when you get into the presence of God. Because God's not going to let you go so long without giving you something in exchange for what you're giving to him. You go expectantly. The Bible, tell, the Bible tells us this in the book of Psalms. It says, in the presence of the Lord, in your presence, O God, there is fullness of joy. There is fullness of peace. You don't have joy in your life. You don't have peace. You need to get into the presence of God. You need to bless him. Minister to God, worship him, sing to him. Paul would say, sing to the Lord in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make melody in your heart to the Lord. Have a love affair with God. Worship him. We are called to draw near because he desires fellowship with his people and he wants to minister spiritual blessings to you, as I, as I mentioned there. We are called to draw near to God that we may know God in a greater way. Listen, how many of you know if you, the more time you spend with somebody, the more you get to know them? The more time you spend hearing their voice, the more you understand and can discern their voice. And you spend time with God enough in his word and in prayer, you, and you hear something that comes along, it sounds crazy, and you're like, that's not God. I know God. God doesn't sound like that. Jesus would say this, my sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. They'll run away. You know the voice of God when you're in his word and you're discerning. So you fellowship with God because you want to know God more. And the more you hear God's voice, the more you spend time in his presence. That's why when you get married, it's a beautiful thing. The more you spend time with your spouse, the more you get to know them. You get to discern their likes and their dislikes. You get to discern their, their, their desires, right? You get to discern what the, the things that are important to them. It's, it comes with spending time. And ladies, give your husband time, please. He'll, find, he'll figure it out, right? You're like, don't expect them to know it. Well, you ought to know what I want. No, I don't. That takes time. And you also have to communicate it. So God has communicated to us the things that he desires. And so when he holds us accountable, it's based on knowledge. You holding me accountable based on something that you kept in your own mind and you expected me to know like I can read your mind. That's crazy. <laughs> but don't you say that, dude. Don't you use the crazy word because you're going to be sleeping outside. Okay. All right. So that's marriage 101. Um, we are called to draw near to God so that we may be filled with him, filled with his power to live according to his word. Let me tell you something. I prioritize the time that I spend in the presence of the Lord. I need him. Let me tell you something. I need him. I need him. Because if I don't spend time with the Lord, my day is off, my heart is off, my mind is off. I can't focus on the things of God, but God centers my heart. God gives me the presence of the power that I need to be centered in on him. Psalm 73, I, love, I believe it's 73, that one of my favorite Psalms. He says, who have I in heaven but thee, O Lord? In earth is nothing I desire but you. My heart and my flesh, the psalmist confessed and he acknowledged my heart and flesh, they fail, but God is the strength of my heart. And God is my portion. God is my portion. He's the strength of my heart. Without God, I'm lost. Like a ship without a sail, I go nowhere. I stay stagnant. Right? And so you are called to draw near and fellowship with God for everything you need. You need to confess to God daily that, God, you are enough for me. You are what I need. 
And there's going to be times where the world around you is going to entice you. The enemy of your soul is going to entice you to make you think that there's something else other than God that you need. And it's going to overwhelm you if you don't get back into the presence of God. And I love the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm 73. The psalmist actually earlier in that psalm, he said, I looked at the wicked and I coveted them. And I was almost drawn away because of what I saw happening in their lives. I saw them getting blessed, and I saw them getting good things in their lives, and here I am suffering. Here I am. I'm struggling. God, what's up with that? He was asking God questions, and he said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and I recognized that everything that they're doing is going to lead to their destruction, but God has everything I need, and then he culminated by saying, who have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire. God is the strength of my heart. Know that God is your everything. Make God your source. Seek God is the very thing that you can't live without. And until you get to that place where God is something, someone, and God is the, the very presence of God, and the word of God is something that you cannot live without, then you're going to be missing out on the blessing of God. And you're going to continue to look at the peripheral things around you until you let God center your heart in on him. Amen? Let's look to the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you. Because you are so good. I bless you because you're merciful. I bless you because of your love, your loving kindness, your tender mercies. God, you give us grace. God, we blow it. We stumble. As James said, we stumble in many ways. But you're so merciful, God. Because you grant us grace that teaches us godliness and righteousness and faithfulness. And you give us time to get it right. So, Lord, may we take advantage of the space that you give us to come into the holy place of your presence. May we take advantage of it daily. May we see it as a privilege. May we see it as a right that you've given to those you call priests. May we see it as a necessity. May we see it like the very oxygen that our lungs need to breathe. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.